You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. Do you ever stop to think about how your life could change in the blink of an eye? Every morning each of us gets up and assumes that each day will turn out just fine, but then something happens that changes the courses of our lives forever. You know, it could be the birth of a child, being diagnosed with a dreadful disease, or simply losing your job. Take, for example, the story of Siegel Castle. He was born in Albia, Iowa on November 27th of 1862. And at 24 years of age, he married Ida Chedesta, after which the newlyweds moved to South Dakota. Between 1888 and 1900, the couple would have six children. In order, they were Roy, William, Rena, Earl, Eva, and Laura. The last, Laura, was born on April 7, 1900, and just two months later, Mrs. Castle would pass away. While neither her exact dates of birth or death are known, she was approximately 32 years of age at the time. This left Siegel alone to care for their six children, all under the age of 12. Five years later, on January 24, 1905, Siegel would marry once again. This time it was to his late wife's younger sister, Edith Mary Chedester. He was 42 and she was 27 years old at the time of their union. Together the couple would have three additional children, and they're all important to the story. There was Bertha Irene, Sylvia May, and the youngest, Evelyn Helen, who was born on May 21st of 1916. At the time of Evelyn's birth, all but one of Siegel's six children from his first marriage were adults. In fact, the youngest was 16. Many years later, Evelyn would write, Papa was a kind and loving father to me. I remember him most as a quiet man who sat by the table at night and read by the lamplight. He worked hard. She had equally kind words to say regarding her mother. It's hard to write of my mama. My whole world revolved around her, and no one has ever taken her place. She was a small woman with dark red hair piled high on her head. She wore long skirts down to her ankles. She walked with a limp as she'd been hurt when she was young. She'd fallen from a horse and hurt her hip. It had not healed right. I remember picking sweet wild strawberries with her, of being caught in a hailstorm and running with her as they came down big as hen eggs. The memories are endless. On June 2, 1925, Siegel Castle would once again face the loss of a loved one. His second youngest daughter from his first marriage, 28-year-old Eva Amanda Castle Harvey, she died of cancer. She was survived by her husband Clarence and their four young children. I spoke with Perry Reader Jr. He's Siegel's grandson and his daughter Evelyn's son, and he told me the following. One of his favorite daughters from that older family died of cancer, and it made him so um, he didn't want to be around there anymore, and he wanted to kind of get a new life. So he uh, sold everything, and they moved. Evelyn, who's no longer with us, wrote about what happened next. After her death, Papa decided to move out to Oregon. He bought a car, and since he didn't know how to drive and wasn't about to learn, he asked Otis Angle, my sister Bertha's boyfriend, to drive us out. We left South Dakota in late July 1925. We stopped first at my brother Earl Castle in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, for a short visit with him and his family. We then went through Wyoming to Yellowstone Park to see Old Faithful. How that Model T Ford made it over those high passes is a miracle. She continues... Later, coming down the Columbia River in Oregon, we stopped at Multnomah Falls. There was a small store there, and Sylvia May and I were allowed to buy some cupcakes. This was my first experience with store-bought cupcakes. So I started to take a bite out of mine, and Mama said, Don't eat the paper, Evelyn. We went to Portland, Oregon to visit my Uncle Emmett J. Castle and his son Merwin. Otis Angle stayed in Portland to get work. On August 13, 1925, we started to our new home in Eugene, Oregon. It was at this point that 16-year-old Merwin Castle was recruited to drive the car to their final destination. 
He was an inexperienced driver who had obtained his license just three weeks earlier. I don't know in them days if they had to even apply for a license. All they had to do was to be able to drive. Merm was at the wheel as he drove the jalopy southward from Portland. Mrs. Castle sat beside him in the front seat, while Siegel and the couple's three children were in the back. As the sun was setting on Thursday, August 13, 1925, that's the same day you just heard Evelyn mention, Merwin came upon a portion of the road just north of Harrisburg that was being paved. This forced him to make a detour across the railroad tracks that ran parallel to the road. And without looking, Merwin turned the car up a short grade to cross the tracks. But what he didn't see was that the southbound number 33 Southern Pacific train was coming up from behind at an estimated 50 miles per hour, or 80.5 kilometers per hour. The uh, detour run parallel to the tracks for a couple of hundred feet, or maybe more. Merwin probably was was not looking behind him. You know, the, the train would be coming from behind, and he would be uh, turning to his uh, left and going across the tracks, I've been to that crossing, and that crossing is a raised, like you know, like six or seven feet off of the level ground, and it raises up for the gravel for the train tracks. And they were probably on that, and the way I would see it, and he, and he probably never even noticed the train coming from the from behind him. The occupants of a car waiting to cross on the opposite side of the track yelled out a warning to Merwin but he couldn't hear them over the deafening sound of the approaching train and its whistle. Engineer Harvey Carpenter was at the throttle when he spotted the car just as it was going over the tracks. He didn't see it until the last second because the car did not have its headlights on. There was very little that Harvey could do. He immediately jammed on the locomotive's emergency brakes while blasting its whistle in a last-second attempt to get the car cleared from the tracks. But it was too late. The train rammed into the car nearly dead center. Harvey Carpenter watched in horror as his locomotive pushed the automobile along the tracks for several rail lengths before it was finally pushed off to the left of the train. As awful as you can imagine that this accident was, it was far worse because the car was open-topped. The scene can only be described as gruesome with body parts scattered along the tracks. 62-year-old Siegel Castle, his 47-year-old wife Edith, and their two daughters, 18-year-old Bertha and 15-year-old Sylvia, all lost their lives in that accident. Their bodies were taken to a local undertaker, and Uncle Emmett Castle arrived the next morning to arrange for their burial. Yeah, they were all so badly beat up, you know, that they just buried him in one, one grave that I know of. A quick check on the Find the Grave website confirms that the four are buried under one gravestone. It simply reads, Castle, Bertha Sylvia Edith Siegel, August 14, 1925. Well, we've been down to the grave, and uh, this is like, you know, uh, 40 years later, or even longer, maybe 50 years later. And the track is still in the same place. And the graveyard is relatively close, but about five miles from where the accident happened. It, the graveyard is uh, is north of where the accident happened. And the train still goes down through there. And when that train comes thundering down through there and you're standing at the graves, you know how trains are. They make a lot of noise and bump and bang the cars together as they go and you can kind of feel the vibration, and if you're standing there in the evening, it kind of is a little bit spooky if it's a still day. It's spooky if you know the people who were buried there and the accident happened just a little ways away from there. At the time of the accident, newspapers were quick to report that the castles were on their way to the Harrisburg hop yards to help in the harvest before heading off to Eugene. That's where Siegel supposedly had accepted a position on a dairy farm, but Perry said that this was not true. We've always known that the, the articles about 
them being hop pickers was untrue. That was made up by some reporter. Well, he was a teacher first, then he did some farming, and then he uh, did some logging, you know, part-times. The truth is that Siegel was headed to Eugene to purchase a farm of his own. His descendants believe that Siegel must have had enough money with him to at least make a down payment. But any money that Siegel may have had on him, which is believed to have been a fairly large sum, it disappeared at the time of the wreckage. So you're probably wondering what happened to the driver of the car, you know, Siegel's nephew Merwin Castle. Well, surprisingly, very little. He was found lying in a daze next to the wrecked car. His only injuries were a few bruises and a cut on his eyebrow. You know, he was most likely just flipped right out of the car. And he, is, um, he had a bad cut on the eyebrow. And that's about all the injury he had. He, he walked away from it. Right after Harvey Carpenter stopped the train, he immediately jumped out to offer any assistance that he could. Now, it's unclear who made the discovery first, either Harvey Carpenter or the train's conductor, who was identified only as Mr. Caffin, but they found an incredible surprise on the cowcatcher. You know, that's the metal grate on the older trains that would push cattle and other objects off the track. There, against all odds, nine-year-old Evelyn Castle was found hanging from the cowcatcher. Badly injured, she had somehow survived the impact with the train. Now, no one can say with any certainty how she ended up there. Maybe it was due to pure luck, but Evelyn remembered it differently. She had been sitting on her dad's lap at the moment of impact, and as the train was being dragged along, she said that he placed her on the cowcatcher. But if you could imagine, they were both traveling along uh, side by side there for just a second or two, and he probably just saw a chance to lay her on it and uh, keep her from the car from... uh, the car was being smashed while he was doing that, and then it, then it rolled and flipped. You know, they say the time slows down during an accident, and this may have been no exception. You also need to keep frame of reference in mind. Both the car and the train were moving at the same exact speed, you know, as basically one unit for several seconds. You can see what he was thinking. He could probably see what was going to happen. And so he just pushed her over there and hoped that she would, uh, all the uh, cars flipping around and things would miss her. But it was his only chance because he was probably, I I don't know, but he was probably sitting behind Merwin. And so he probably uh, just thought, well, here's her only chance. And just, uh, there was a open top car. So he just, lift her up and push her over there. After Evelyn was removed from the cow catcher, it was clear that she was in urgent need of medical attention. Unfortunately, no physician was available locally. So the decision was made to transport both Evelyn and Merwin to a hospital in Eugene, which lies about 20 miles or 32 kilometers to the south. Both were placed aboard the train, that's the same exact train involved in the accident, and Harvey Carver and he just opened throttle. Upon arrival in Eugene, a waiting ambulance rushed Evelyn to the hospital. Years later, Evelyn described her injuries. I had a broken arm, which they put in a cast from my shoulder to my wrist, some cuts and bruises. I suffered mostly from shock. I was not released from the hospital until two weeks later. I was unable to walk and had to be in a wheelchair. While she recovered, it was determined that Harvey Carpenter was blameless for the accident. But unbeknownst to Evelyn at the time, at the end of nearly every run, Harvey Carpenter would go to the hospital and bring her flowers and gifts. But none of these material items could erase his guilt. The very thought of Evelyn clinging onto that cow catcher continued to be a burden on his mind. It bothered Harvey Carpenter because he, he said when he was driving the train that he would see her constantly. It was the first time he'd seen her on the, the front of the train, bruised. But Harvey was, felt guilty, even though he was innocent, he felt guilty about it. And he 
was haunted by it. Upon release from the hospital, a woman obtained permission from Evelyn's uncle Emmett to take her to a local hotel that she owned. The mayor of Harrisburg presented Evelyn with $10, which is about $150 today, but when she awoke the next morning, the money was gone. When questioned about it, the proprietor told Evelyn, quote, Someone has to pay for your keep. Two days later, Emmett Castle came to get Evelyn and took her back to his Portland home. Since his wife had been previously committed to the Oregon State Mental Hospital, he was unable to care for her. He opted to place Evelyn with another family. They took me to church every night. They would put me on a platform and get down on their knees and howl and pray aloud. This frightened me so much I would cry and beg them not to take me. I finally got so bad that they thought I was losing my mind. I'd crawled under a stationary table with stationary benches on either side. I wouldn't come out, so they put a blanket in there for me and closed the curtains. They talked in whispers around me. My arm hurt me. The cast was still on. Her next memory was that of someone whispering to her, It's the man who killed your folks. She described what happened next. I saw a big, tall man with a look of shocked disbelief on his face. This was the first time to my knowledge that I'd ever seen Harvey Carpenter. Of course, I didn't know his name at the time. It was clear that Evelyn was not adapting well to her new home, so the court stepped in and ordered that she be placed in the care of the Portland Boys and Girls Aid Society. While there, Harvey Carpenter continued to visit with her. Harvey Carpenter, who was the engineer on the fateful train, and his wife, Alta, came to visit me at the orphanage. They got permission to take me out for a visit to their beautiful home. After having me there for a week or two, they decided to legally adopt me. Initially, the court ordered that Evelyn be placed in the care of the Carpenters, but her uncle Emmett Castle contested that decision. A jury decided on November 3, 1925, that full custody of Evelyn should be granted to the Carpenters. But legal challenges continued until January 11, 1926. That's when Judge Jacob Kanzer ruled in the Carpenter's favor. He stated, quote, The court is glad to decree this adoption because the future welfare of this little girl is now provided for. Harvey and Alta Carpenter were in their late 40s. Both of them had been married and divorced before. They had only been married two years before they adopted me. They took me into their home and gave me everything a little girl could want. Harvey Carpenter became the most wonderful dad a girl ever had. But even with all this, it took me months to get well, and I didn't go to school until the next fall. I'd missed a year of school. She continued. After I got well, I took piano lessons, dancing lessons, and learned to roller skate with the kids in the neighborhood. In the fall of 1927, we moved from Portland to Dallas, Oregon. In this little town, I finished growing up. I asked Evelyn's son, Perry, what Harvey Carpenter was like. Oh, he was a real popular person. He was a real nice guy. Uh, He became a hero after he adopted my mother. and uh, My mother loved him because uh, he just would do anything for her. And uh, he was well-liked all his life. Uh, My younger brother, Harvey, was named after uh, Harvey Carpenter. His name is Harvey Carpenter Reader. And so my mother thought a lot about Harvey Carpenter. She idolized him. It was on June 30th, 1943, after 45 years of continuous service, that 66-year-old Harvey Carpenter would one last time climb into the cab of the northbound train headed out of Eugene. In retirement, he took on a number of different jobs. This included at one point serving as the chief of police in West Salem, Oregon, and at the age of 70, he became the keeper of the Oregon Senate's North Door. He was 83 years old when he passed away in San Francisco, on April 5th of 1960. He was survived by his wife, Alta, his daughter, Annette, from his first marriage, and, of course, Evelyn. 
As for Evelyn, she writes, On August 8, 1936, I married Perry Charles Reeder. We have four children. I didn't know there was a depression until then, but I soon found out. We had quite a struggle raising our family. During the Second World War, the couple decided to leave Portland for a more rural way of life. In 1944, they settled in the failed resort town of Bay Ocean, Oregon. Perry explains. It was like it was going to be a uh, boardwalk of the West. That's what they wanted it to be. So they had uh, rich people lived out there, but they all abandoned it. And us poor people could, uh, like mom and dad, could rent you know, a nice place for but near nothing. And that's how we lived. Evelyn would work different jobs to help support her family. That included being the postmaster of the Bay Ocean Post Office from 1950 through 1954. We were lived under poor conditions by today's standards. Uh, we were a poor family, but everybody else in the whole countryside was poor, lived the same standard we did. So we didn't know any different. We just uh, existed from payday to payday. And we would uh, all go to the movie on Friday nights, and we had quite a upbringing. Today, Bay Ocean no longer exists, having long been washed into the sea by coastal erosion. But as we spoke, it was clear that Perry looked back on both Bay Ocean and its childhood with great fondness. In fact, he penned the book Bay Ocean, Memories Beneath the Sand with his daughter Sarah MacDonald, which you can find on both the Amazon and Barnes & Noble websites. I asked Perry if his mom had suffered from any long-term effects from the accident. No, I, it would just be mental if she had any, but she didn't uh, manifest anything. She seemed to have left it behind somehow. Sadly, Evelyn Helen Castle Carpenter Reeder, the proud mother of four children, passed away on June 11, 1985, at the age of 69. When she died, she died of cancer of... Uh, pancreatic cancer, and we I was at her bedside, and she was calling out to Daddy, and I think that she only called her real father Daddy. I think she called um, the uh, Carpenters, I think they, she called them in a more formal Mama and Papa, but she was seeing Daddy when she was dying, right at the her very last hours. In fact, an hour before she died, she was yelling, Daddy. Uh, so she she was always thinking about that accident. I mean, it never left her. So you might say that it did have an effect on her. Well, it obviously did. <laughs> it clearly did. And to think that that one single event, which lasted just a few seconds, completely changed the course of her entire life. Useless? Useful? I'll leave that for you to decide. They say there's a time and a place for everything. And though it may seem a little odd for me to interrupt at this grim moment in our high adventure story, this is the time and place I'm supposed to talk to you men about the value of good grooming and Old Spice aftershave lotion. But it's worth the interruption, because we all know how much good grooming really counts in business as well as social life. And we know the wonderful feeling of self-confidence that comes to a man when he's sure of his good grooming. That's why it's so important to make a habit of using Old Spice aftershave lotion every time you shave. Once you've tried Old Spice lotion, its bracing freshness will become a part of your daily life you'll never want to miss. Old Spice aftershave lotion is soothing, cooling, and healing to the skin. And it has a clean, fresh, masculine scent that men prefer. No wonder more men buy Old Spice than any other aftershave lotion at a dollar. So remember, for a wonderful sense of confidence and well-being, use Old Spice aftershave lotion every time you shave. That commercial for Old Spice is from the April 9th, 1950 broadcast of High Adventure. This particular episode was titled Inside Story. Now, the show was similar in formula to the popular CBS series Escape, and it premiered on the Mutual Network on March 1st of 1947. 
It originally broadcast at 9.30 p.m. on Saturday evenings, but it bounced around their schedule until January 21, 1949. That's when it moved to Sunday afternoons on NBC. It was there that the show landed Old Spice as a sponsor. Sadly, NBC dropped the show in 1950. Now, my fondest memories of Old Spice were of my grandfather, who always had a bottle of it in his bathroom. That distinct smell of Old Spice will forever remind me of him. Old Spice was the creation of William Lightfoot Schultz. He was born in Springfield, Ohio in 1876 to a Quaker family and attended the Friends Select School in Wilmington, Delaware, from which he graduated at the age of 16. After that, he went to work as a stock boy at a Philadelphia interior decorating firm. But at night, he studied art and architecture under the direction of famed artist Maxfield Parrish and stained glass designer Nicola DeCenzo. In 1904, he formed a partnership with DeCenzo. The new company designed and sold mosaics and leaded glass for use in homes and churches. Schultz served as the business's salesman, and while the company was successful, Schultz decided to sell off his portion of the business in 1910. His next step was to move to New York City where he set up the Lightfoot Schultz Company and they manufactured soap and other toiletries. Lightfoot Schultz did very well until the Great Depression when the company found itself short of cash. As a result, Schultz was forced to sell his controlling interest in Lightfoot Schultz to the American Safety Razor Company in 1930. He would stay on as president of Lightfoot Schultz until 1933. His next move was to start a new company called Schulten. His first products were what he knew best, you know, soaps. In reality, his new company didn't manufacture anything. His soaps were made by the John T. Stanley Company in packaging that was designed by the Carl Voss Corporation. Schultz acted solely as a salesman for the soaps, arranging to have them privately labeled for various department stores. His company sales totaled $165,000 in 1933. That translates into about $3.3 million today. In 1937, Schulten was approached by Bullock's department store in Los Angeles to manufacture a line of toiletries with a colonial design. Now, the deal with Bullock's ultimately fell through, but Schultz decided to move forward with the development of the new product line. It was later that year that Schulten introduced its early American Old Spice line, and it consisted of various toiletries such as soap, perfume, bath salt, dusting powder, and toilet water. And what's probably most surprising, it was designed for women. While the product line had only been on sale for a few months prior to the end of 1937, the company grossed $77,000, which is about $1.4 million today. They grossed $77,000, and it was clear that this new product line was a success. So in 1938, the company introduced its Old Spice line of men's toiletries. It included aftershave lotion, cologne, soap, talcum powder, and a shaving mug. It was that shaving mug that was first to bear what would become Old Spice's trademark. There was an image of a frigate named the Grand Turk on it, and ever since there have been images of ships on their products. From that point on, the sales of Old Spice just skyrocketed. By 1939, sales of the line totaled $3.1 million, which would be nearly $58 million today. Shulton would continue to introduce new products and acquire other businesses for the next few decades. It wasn't until the company's 1969-70 fiscal year that the company would experience its first decline in sales volume. As a result of significant financial losses, the company merged with American Cyanamid in February 1971. But they couldn't stop their decline in market share, so Procter & Gamble agreed to purchase Shulton's Old Spice line of fragrances, deodorants, and skin care in June 1990. At first, it seems as if Procter & Gamble was doing little to promote the Old Spice line, but that all changed in 2008 with their Old Spice Swagger campaign. This helped transform Old Spice from a product designed for elderly gentlemen, you know, like my grandfather, into something that the modern man uses. 
Today's store shelves are lined with Old Spice products. Personally, I find it all a bit overwhelming. You know, it used to be so easy to pick out a deodorant. A typical store would stock a few brands, and all you had to do was choose between a stick, a roll-on, or a spray. I did a quick check of the Old Spice website, and they show that there are 24 different offerings of Old Spice deodorant and antiperspirant. Can someone tell me what Clean Slate or Fresh Start or Fiji or Volcano smells like? I haven't a clue. So here's a question for you. Every year there's some movie that's so incredibly popular that it's called a blockbuster. You know, Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Men in Black, Titanic, and so on. But do you know where this term originated from? Well, hang around for a bit and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are three stories in which someone got the last laugh. On April 11th of 1935, William Lipson, who was a shoe salesman from Providence, Rhode Island, he parked his car outside of a Waterbury, Connecticut hotel. He later discovered that someone had stolen 55 shoes from the vehicle, so he reported the theft to the police. Upon hearing of the crime, Detective John Galvin stated, quote, Maybe we better look for a man with a new pair of shoes. To which Lipson replied, Oh no, that is, unless the thief is a one-legged man. For you see, they were sample shoes and no two are alike. In fact, as samples, all 55 shoes were for the right foot. In our next story, James Waters was working in a Chicago auto agency in 1952 when an elderly man walked in with a package for the boss. He said that $6.75 was due, that's about $65 today, $6.75 was due, which she gladly paid. Well, it turns out that the package contained an old oil can that was filled with water. She couldn't have been too pleased when her boss refused to reimburse her for the costly mistake. Fast forward to November 17th of 1955. Miss Waters was now employed at the Sugar McMahon Ford dealership at 4868 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Once again, a man walked into the dealership with a, quote, a package for the boss. This time, he said that $6 was due. But Miss Waters was not about to be fooled again. She politely asked the man to wait as she stepped into the dealership's office and telephoned the police. As officers arrested the phony delivery man, who was identified as Oscar Tilden, he stated, quote, Almost four million people in Chicago and I bump into her again. And in our last story for today, on Sunday, August 1st, 1965, 17-year-old Cheryl Bedrock of 636 Floral Avenue in Elizabeth, New Jersey, she received the call of a lifetime. The caller identified himself as Paul McCartney and told Cheryl that she had won first prize in the Golden Rolls Royce contest. She was about to spend an entire week with the Beatles. So Cheryl's mother got on the phone and spoke to a second man, He said that he was the Beatles' manager, Brian Epstein, and told Cheryl she'd be flying aboard BOAC at a Kennedy airport the next Saturday. Well, upon hanging up, a call was made to BOAC, and they confirmed that they had a New York to London reservation for Cheryl. After hanging up, an uncle decided to do some further checking. While there had been, in fact, a plane reservation made in Cheryl's name, records showed that it had been made by her mother, which, of course, they knew wasn't true. So another call was made to Brian Epstein's New York office, and they told the uncle that they had never heard of the contest. Cheryl's brother Lewis told the press, quote, If it is a hoax, it's really amazing. My mother is skeptical about anything like this, and if they convinced her over the phone, they must have been good. Well, it really was a hoax, but when the promoters of the Beatles' legendary August 15, 1965 Shea Stadium concert caught wind of what had happened, they provided Cheryl with two free tickets and limousine service to the show. So earlier I'd asked you where the term blockbuster came from. Did you know? 
Well, it's commonly thought that the term started with Steven Spielberg's 1975 classic movie Jaws, where people would line up for an entire city block for tickets, but that is incorrect. Well, it turns out that the term had been in use for movies prior to that. Movies such as Giant, The Ten Commandments, and The Bridge Over the River Kwai were referred to as blockbusters. It was also the title of the 1944 movie, The Blockbusters, starring Monogram's Pictures, East Side Kids. But back in the 1940s, the term had a much different meaning. It really meant to bust or destroy an entire city block, as in a powerful bomb. The blockbusters were among the most powerful conventional bombs used during World War II. As the term was repeatedly used by the press and reports on Allied aerial bombings, Blockbuster quickly entered the lexicon to describe things that were explosive or supersized, you know, whether that be movies or deep discounted department store sales. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. I just want to give a big thanks to Perry Reader for allowing me to interview him, and to his daughter Sarah McDonald for both arranging for me to speak with Perry and for providing me with photographs that I will post my website shortly. As I'm finishing this recording, I am anxiously awaiting the manuscript for my book back from my editor. She told me yesterday that I should have it back later today, and I'm very curious to see what changes she has made. As I've mentioned before, the book is titled The Flip Side of History, and is available for pre-order on both Barnes & Noble and Amazon. If you haven't done so already, be sure to sign up for my Twitter feed. It's at UselessInfoCast, and you'll be among the first to know when a new episode is released. Again, the handle is at Useless Infocast. Also, be sure to like the show on Facebook. Just do a quick search for the Useless Information podcast there, and it should show up. If you go to my website, which is uselessinformation.org, you can find transcripts of the podcast along with corresponding images. That includes the images for this particular story. If you'd like to contact me for any reason, you can email me at steve at uselessinformation.org. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Anyway, thanks again for listening, and I hope you tune in next time. Bye.